time for 28mm World War II action. Will you recreate history or reshape it your way? On the Bolt Action Hub at beastsofwar.com. Anime cyberpunk style meets skirmish combat in Infinity. Experience eight high-tech factions and fight to control the human sphere at the Infinity Hub on beastsofwar.com. Hello everybody, I am back with Constantinos and Stavros from Parabellum and we are here to talk about more Conquest. Today it's going to be the Hundred Kingdoms and the Spire. So humans and elves-ish? Ish. 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 <laughs> I love putting an ish in there whenever I'm not sure about a thing because then it's just like, you might be right. <laughs> so guys, uh, where would we like to begin with this one? This is going to be a bit more of a background chat about these factions, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, let's start with saying that they are the two factions in our starter box. Mm -hmm. I think this is the the main thing about them they are the factions we introduce the world with mm -hmm. and but since you said that ish i think it would be good to start actually with uh with aspires okay. explain why it's ish, ish. yeah <laughs> so um as we as we mentioned before in the previous one um yeah. we try very hard to introduce real history real historical events and dress them up yeah. in the right way um the way a lot of people are surprised to find out for example uh, game of thrones is based on the war of the roses and mm. It's it's as you mentioned. It's a very clever thing to do. Yeah, what? Hmm? <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> you did. Um, so as you mentioned, when there's a history behind something, there's automatically a lot of connections mm. that come with it, and you don't have to think and mention everything. So um, when we were trying to think of all the common fantasy tropes that exist in every game world, we wanted to be a little bit subversive and a little bit original with them. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really how the spires were born. They okay. do fulfill the role of what is traditionally like the elven role. Yeah. But we we tried very hard not to, um, not to project humanity onto every one of the factions and, and be like, oh, these are large, green, angry humans. These are small, stout, uh, angry humans, and these are yeah. tall, arrogant, angry humans, and yeah. they fight the normal humans and <laughs> each other. Why is everybody angry? Um, it's a war game. <laughs> <laughs> they have to be. <laughs> uh, um, no, but actually, there's. Um, we made a point of not making it uh, some eternal war, mm -hmm. just a series of events mm -hmm. that destabilize the political I see. climate I see. Um, in the world. But uh, so the spires, um, mm -hmm. they're the oldest of the factions. They're the sole surviving. Yeah. 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 Wow, sir. <laughs> That does not look like what I would consider a traditional elf to look like. Good, you know, so you nailed it then. <laughs> you really have. I mean, like, there's a, an ornateness, an arrogance, that sort of overmind look. You know, I am the evil master. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's really cool. And again, my God, the the detail that has been gone into in this artwork. Oh wait, his head's down there. <laughs> yeah, um, he's got two huge bodyguards with faces at their collars. Yeah. Oh, gods. It's all of this is worked into the background. Um, I can actually tell you that when the artist walked in mm -hmm. a month late when he was supposed <laughs> to deliver this this art piece, he walks in and I'm fuming and then I, I see it on my screen and, and two seconds later he walks in the door and I can't be mad at him. I just I took off my shoe and I threw it at him. <laughs> <laughs> I had no other way of responding. I'm like, I'm is, so is, mad at you, but this is so good. Is that how you say hello? <laughs> No, it's how you say, damn you and your talent. <laughs> <laughs> but no, gorgeous. don't damn you. No, no. no. <laughs> um, so, yes, uh, back to the spires. Yes. Um, as, as, you, as you got it, yes, definitely the arrogance mm. that is very traditionally associated with the yeah. faction in question, the elves. There's, there's a decadence to it mm -hmm. as well. If I may add, it, it's also the, that eternal feel, mm. you know, that a lot of time. Mm. Because if you see, there's a lot of noise all around him. Mm. And yet the central figure is just thinking. It's, he has all the time in the world to think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's how we wanted to project that trope. Yeah. The, the, the ornateness there is what I would, would expect of an elvish race. See, I got mm -hmm. the issue in there. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but uh, there's also a, a real dark, gritty, biomancy sort of feel to it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know, I, I think, oh, was it Leo I spoke to, I think, a little bit before about this, but... Can you guys maybe delve a little bit deeper into what the hell? <laughs> so um, the concept here with them starts um, 
the the elves are not native mm. to this realm. They're not native to this world. Mm. Um, they came from somewhere else. Mm. Um, uh, to cut this long story short, because otherwise we'll go into a thousand little <laughs> backstories and interesting oh, facts. Come on, our viewers love tangents, um, <laughs> as we all know. Don't, yeah, but don't, uh, do they do they have two hours to look at to <laughs> stare at the video and <laughs> slowly drool? Well, you see, um, the, the good thing is a lot of our viewers actually paint while they listen to oh. us. So if you would like a little bit of a tangent, I'll, I'll give you one. Okay. <laughs> so yes, the idea is that um, these uh, we call them the exiles, mm. they arrived on this planet first as explorers, mm -hmm. um, possibly colonizers. Um, colonizers, that's not the right word. Um, yeah, it would be. Pioneers, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're the first wave. The, they were the first wave. Mm. and uh, But the first wave were scientists, mm. right? And they created the, the, the spires, the, the unique biomes where they live. Mm. Um, these... Yes. Now, what makes these el elves, uh, the spires, the exiles unique, is biomancy, their ability to affect and modify life. Mm. Um, and uh, they, in the beginning, this was a much more contained. They, it was a tradition called life binding, mm -hmm. and it was a much more sacred art. It was a sort of a rite of passage that they could bond with other life and adopt part of it, come closer to it. Mm -hmm. Um, a series of events caused the society of the exiles to fracture. Mm -hmm. The uh, the spire dragon war that we mentioned in yes. the last episode, um, that is one of the stresses that made s their society fracture. Mm -hmm. So the spires are only one of the factions. Um, the other two have gone their own ways and will come back in the lore. Okay. The spires are the political leadership mm -hmm. and the a scientific leadership of the first wave that came that's okay that's an interesting take on a society i'm just i'm going to pause right there for a second because normally whenever we look at societies within fantasy games you're always having you know i am the big mighty hero i slew the dragon i am your leader now actually having a political science sort of mm -hmm. cast that's leading a society well that's going to lead to some very interesting changes in you know the way the society lives, the way they politically operate, the way they even view other nations. Mm -hmm. Very intriguing. Mm -hmm. um, we, for them, um, are the, the source of inspiration, I'm trying to put them together, actually came from studying the East, the East India Company. Ah. Um, because the idea was that the original colonization was funded by the sovereign house mm -hmm. on the other planet. The, he was, let's call it the supreme ruler mm. among, among a nation of equals-ish. Yes. <laughs> Um, but when they're forced to run away due to a calamity that we can't unfortunately reveal yet, um, because it would reveal too much of the background, mm. um, he made very certain that his house was the only one that managed to survive, to exit. All right. So yeah, yeah, you're, you're a skip, but yeah, that, that, don't worry. It, 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 it I know that looks weird, but it, it works. Promise. <laughs> yes, promise. it works just fine. Don't worry. I'm not going to press this button. Oh dear God. Oh, now you can't come. Bye bye. <laughs> that is uh, essentially what happened. The moment his own lineages passed mm. into, uh, air or the world of conquest, uh, -huh. uh he cut all ties Ooh. and left tremendous chunks of the population behind, uh, uh -huh. The let's call it the, the the labor and warrior castes that were fighting in the back were uh, abandoned, um, and this this created the first rift in the society um, that wasn't truly exposed until the Dragon War, which were the pressures forced the society mm -hmm. the, their civilization essentially to collapse. So it was the political and scientific leadership mm -hmm. um, sp uh, split, then the religious and craftsmen. Mm -hmm. Where are the other split, and the last is the uh, the labor and warrior caste mm -hmm. that split. So the spires, as we mentioned before, mm -hmm. they were the scientists and the political leaders. I yeah, see. that. that ooh, here we go. Ooh. Yeah, um, beautiful art again. Um, yeah, now I'm getting that that elven flavor, but with with such a nice twist to it. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. So. Uh, Obviously, when you have a bunch of politicians, a bunch of scientists, there's not, not many people to lead when they've yeah. all left. <laughs> yeah. um, their solution was to pervert this life binding mm -hmm. and turn it into what we call biomancy, right. which is, it's a science. It's no longer an art or religious observation. It is, they've literally turned it into this cold-hearted science. Mm -hmm. And they create a whole bunch of um, clones mm -hmm. and drones. We differentiate between clones and drones. Clones are something that you put effort into. 
mm-hmm. and make it pretty. Drones you create thousands of to do menial labor. Yeah. Um, but obviously there starts being tr- uh, a power struggle between the political and the scientific leadership yeah. of the spires. Um, and uh, again, because they saw how ruthless uh, the sovereign can be, there is a, a, a coup. Sovereign rounds up all the biomancers as yeah. the um, as the, the scientific faction are known, and the biomancers say, "Oh yeah, you've caught us. You've you know, well done, very clever. How precisely do you intend to run the spires now? Because every spire mm-hmm. um, is actually an incredibly densely populated uh, hyper oh. hive arcology where they all live in, and it's all uh, regulated by the biomancers." Uh. And so they said simply, sure, congratulations, you've caught us. Do um, you know how to operate this? <laughs> <laughs> so that leads to a very, very strange status quo, mm-hmm. where what you have is that while it is acknowledged that the sovereign and all his lineages in paying for uh, this exploration in the beginning own mm-hmm. all of the assets and all of the resources, mm-hmm. it's better left managed by the directorate. They're the sub-faction Mm-hmm. It, within the spires, it's a scientific, let's say. So it's an ability owns everything, mm-hmm. but the scientists manage it. Okay, this might be me saying something wrong here, but this kind of feels like Great Britain to me with our royal family. <laughs> I, th- there was a fair chunk of there was a fair chunk of, uh, of some amount of inspiration from there in the East India Company. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and how this worked. So this creates some very, very uh, interesting dynamics and power struggles between the two groups. Mm-hmm. And uh, you have uh, the the scientists who want their pet project to go ahead, yes. but they need funding for that. They need resources, so they yes. have to cater to the nobility. On the other hand, the nobility can't simply say, "I want this done," because it's not their call. So they have to bribe the directorate yes. with uh, resources here and there. And uh, the 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 path to power is no longer just breeding, but it's also seats in the directorate. Mm-hmm. So it creates an incredibly fluid. Mm-hmm. society in which powerful houses, if they don't produce young, brilliant minds to to join the directorate and to replace those that leave a Kate or are uh, made uh, redundant um, <laughs> uh, in, in rather final fashion, um, they can easily um, they can easily become uh, what's it called relegated in, mm-hmm. to unimportance. So it's a shifting society that mm-hmm. benefits the directorate, mm-hmm. who leaves the sovereign and the noble houses. Mm-hmm. To their own little political gains, while it focuses on it, on its goals, it also leaves a great focus within the actual societal structure. That when children are born, there is a, a great push for them to be more educated and better than their the previous mm-hmm. generations. So that will lead to well, in any society like that, that would lead to really strong advancements within everything. Mm-hmm. Which is why you need we needed a, a a direction for the whole society, which is the original contract that they have between yeah. them, and what the ultimate goal is mm-hmm. for the sovereign, at least. Yeah, there there are different goals. The sovereign is looking to reconquer his old realm. Yep. So he sees this world as nothing more than a staging ground. Yes. He's trying to gather as much biomass. Um, to be able to churn it into soldiers for when the moment comes. So he's looking to husband his resources. Mm. Um, while the directorate, the agreement is that the directorate will help him develop the armies and uh, the, the, let's call it the, the, the life strand patterns mm. um, that are needed to create his soldiers. But uh, in return, once the old realm is conquered, yeah, is entrusted is forevermore granted to the directorate. Oh, so they're working together, but not quite. Um, mm. So it creates an interesting dynamic between the two. And one of the beautiful things, that, or one of the things that we thought was very interesting, was to have the uh, the directorate pr- make the same mistake that the um, sovereign did, based out of arrogance. Mm-hmm. They delegated all the unpleasant tasks <laughs> to the underspire, yes. who's the last of the factions. Um, so <clears throat> I think we can show. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> this is a ferromancer, uh, distinguished from a biomancer. A biomancer can affect life itself directly yeah. with his abilities. A ferromancer cannot. He can create and emit pheromones to communicate in a very primal way with the clones and drones, but they are <clears throat> the lowest level of management. Yes, They're still exiles, um, and they're in control of the rest of the society, but 
they are in charge of the functioning of the spire proper. Mm -hmm. um, they're in charge of controlling the drones whose labor makes this possible and the growth vats, mm -hmm. while the biomancers are, you know, entertained with more esoteric pursuits and political plays. Yes, if, if I add this organ to this uh, construct, how will that affect mm -hmm. the overall productivity or efficiency of its creation? Yeah, whereas these are more worried about the strange things going on in the underspire. They're mm -hmm. strange. Um, the notion is uh, you're going to see them um, when we, as, as, as we release more videos, but mm -hmm. the force-grown uh, drones, mm -hmm. they're these pathetic, wretched creations created only to die in seconds, mm -hmm. and their generations are over in heartbeats, mm -hmm. and yet somehow they seem to be forming a cult. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's making the Underspire very nervous, but due to natural arrogance, it's not, not enough attention is being paid to this. Yeah. And this eventually... Um, we hope that to introduce little hooks and plots like this and ask uh, the public mm. how they want this to turn out. I, I, I just have images of, uh, oh, there was, a, there was a film I watched with Antonio Banderas, uh, Ex Machina, I think it was called. It was actually following uh, worker robots gaining consciousness mm -hmm. and creating their new own form of life. This, whoa, mm. you've got me intrigued. <laughs> So the, the idea is to play around this a lot. Mm. Um, now the spires, of course, are, uh, are very dominant and very hierarchical. Mm. Uh, the oldest spires have the largest root networks, which draw in resources directly mm. from which um, the biomancers can play with the, with the, sovereign, uh, with the sovereign lineage's mm -hmm. authorization. Um, but the younger spires don't have so many resources to pull on. On the other hand, that's where most of the innovation happens. They're not as stifled, they're, they're not as uh, controlled. Mm. So it creates strange um, uh, patronage and uh, client relations between the spires that always revolved around the, I give you resources mm. and you give me the newest innovations you have. You give me all the science that you've yeah. developed. And recently, a new, uh, let's call it a new group of spires did the unthinkable and they started trading with the lesser races. Oh, whoops. Yep. <laughs> And this has broken a system that's worked for millennia. Mm. Um, and these merchant princes, as they are known, mm. they're the first ones that reached out and said, why should I go to, uh, you know, the, one of the elder spires and trade away all of my deepest secrets for mm. the raw materials to do what I want, where I can simply get them from yeah. that gentleman over there. You, you'd like to live another 20 years or ensure you have a child, a male yeah. child to carry on your line. Yeah. Here's... A potion that will do that for you. Yeah. In return, I'd like the all of the biomass of this forest. <laughs> um, and uh, that's what they've started doing. Mm -hmm. There's a whole system um, that they that they create. There's a, a trading patterns that they've mm -hmm. created on in, in the world, which they can uh, focus on. Because, for example, they have these massive airships. Mm -hmm. um, these airships are created with an exhaust gas that is only available when the spire is growing. So the older spires don't have access to these type of craft. Ah. Um, these allow them to travel, trade, lift. At the same time, though, uh, their efforts are destabilizing human society. Um, and that's actually where the game kicks off mm. in the conflict between a spire merchant prince yeah. who demands that his contract be mm, fulfilled. Right. And his contract was with a with a baron's um, father, right? Who just wouldn't die, <laughs> so the younger generation couldn't inherit. Yeah, and obviously this leads to uh, uh, let's call it tension. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and eventually, what ends up happening is the son overthrows the father, claiming that you know he extended his life unnaturally. So mm -hmm. um, the spires simply approach and say, "We don't care. We intend to get paid one way or another." Yeah, and that's that's where the conflict comes in. I see. So our contract was to keep this old man alive. Unfortunately, you've killed him, but uh, <laughs> that contract was still signed and you're still mm -hmm. under those terms. Would you perhaps like to live longer or shorter? <laughs> that is essentially it. That's <laughs> essentially it. That yeah. is a very basic way, but yes, yeah, that, that is it. That and is that's, it. Uh, that, that basically segues nicely into the, the Hundred Kingdoms and mm -hmm. the interaction that they both have and how, why both of these nations are, are starting to find that they are in a state of war. Mm -hmm. Um... And it's uh, most often uh, due to the actions of the merchant princes, because of mm. course, if the merchant princes are doing this, the lineage can't stay far behind, mm. um, or too much, or, or the let's call it the political patterns that have held it and they've known will fray. So they start interacting or trying to prevent the interaction. Mm -hmm. Not to mention um, that the directorate, in the meantime, tries to 
protect or at least guide the future of its future ownership. Mm -hmm. I mean, this world will soon be theirs in their mind. Mm -hmm. So don't mess with my stuff. <laughs> I want those humans there and I want those there. And <laughs> if you move them, you interfere with my plans. <laughs> Yeah, and and they're and they're playing both sides. So on exactly. the one hand, they want to get the resources cheaply mm. from the merchant princes who give them to them, yeah. who are trading for them with the humans. On the other hand, they know that they can't upset the status quo because yeah. their contract is what their contract with the sovereign is yeah. based on um, well the status quo itself. Mm. So this creates these interesting uh, patterns and twists within the spires themselves as to how exactly they will um, and how exactly this will shake out. Mm. And, uh, and the easy thing is that when it's not you that's going to war and it's your pets and creations, mm. it's easy to wage war among the spires themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, to so have war among them themselves. It it does. The spires do sound rather terrifying for a, a very simple reason. If the the sovereign is husbanding his forces, what we're seeing on the tabletop could possibly just be the drags or a fraction of what he's actually got in his arsenal. That terrifies me. I'd say me. no comment. Yeah, yes. no, no comment on no that comment. one. No <laughs> comment. I'm, I'm not asking for details. It just terrifies me the concept that there might be big nasties being held back for something else that might eventually have to be thrown out. Yeah, no comment on that No one. comment. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> um, so the, the idea is the Spire forces are composed of clones mm -hmm. that are high-end troops, mm -hmm. drones which are much lower-end troops, generally yep. uh, uh, bred, not bred, um, but grown for a particular role, mm -hmm. not their life expectancies are, aren't expected to be long. Yeah. Um, there are some abominations, so there's a whole menagerie of strange creations yes. that, they've, uh, that they've put <laughs> together to fulfill their roles. And lastly, there's, um, there's like what right now we're calling the Avatara. They are... Um, Basically, what you would imagine um, mechas, but biological mechas that can be mind linked to their user. Ooh. Um, so they never have to risk themselves in battle. They can send forth their, and that's how, that's how the noble lineage fights. They never actually risk themselves. They mm, merely risk their not. prize creations. <laughs> yeah. So you've got this very strange um, aesthetic of the wretched clones wrapped in rags and antiseptics, trying to because they they're bred without an immune system. Um, they've got, they're wrapped in rags with antiseptic to try to make them live just one or two days longer that mm. they might survive. You've got the clones um, hidden behind their armor, well crafted but simple. And then you start moving into the elite clones who have a chance at reaching citizenship, of oh, course. Oh, wow. In a society based on learning and scientific advancement, how far is the soldier going to get? You know, if he, if he hits citizenship and doesn't have to soldier no more, he could go for some education. He could go, but it's it's a tough path, so yeah. it's, it's created a whole subcase again. And then um, and then you have these beautifully bejeweled and created works of art, almost like living statues, mm. that are the forces of the sovereign. Mm. And those are the young nobility imprinted, neurally imprinted into each one of these uh, into each one of these avatara who can, you know. They're pretty scary on the battlefield. I we, can imagine. Yeah, lately in, in all of the playtesting we've been doing, it's like, yeah, we went overboard, bring them down. <laughs> and then we play again and we're like, yeah, they're still overboard, bring them down again. <laughs> um, so, but no, they're, they're, it's, it's going to create a very strange aesthetic uh, mm -hmm. for the entire um, uh, faction. And we're, we're, looking very, we're very much looking forward to seeing how people react to them because mm -hmm. we feel that they're, they're an interesting take on an old trope. Mm. Very, very cool. Okay, let's go a little deeper into the human, the humans. Then, if we're if we're done with the spire, or is there more? No, no I, I think, think that I wraps think, up yeah, what we can us, share so yeah, far. Yeah, okay. I think for now. But that, that was a lot. That was it a lot. Was I'm gonna give lot. you that. So humanity. <laughs> well, humanity is what you expect humanity to be, uh, especially the Hundred Kingdoms. The Hundred Kingdoms are the medieval Europe mm. fantasy take that mm -hmm. we, uh, our take on. Medieval Europe. Uh, they are, if you remember, I think last time we were here, we talked about. Uh, let me show you the the Seal Temple. Yes. In many ways, this is where the Hundred Kingdoms are born. Okay. Because after the fall that devastated the Old Dominion, mm -hmm. all the refugees that well were not close to the impact, obviously, <laughs> uh, they started moving uh, east, uh, west for to avoid the dust to mm -hmm. avoid the huge nuclear winter that was forming already now we also mentioned i think 
about the sacrifice of two gods. Yes. That is believed to be actual history, not just myths. Uh, one of those gods was Ninua, the traditional mother deity that exists in almost all religions. Yes. Uh, now, she literally sacrificed herself in order to stop the full impact of the fall, mm. which would have devastated the planet yes. and eradicate life. Uh, she gave a gift to humanity. I can actually show you the gift, and it's called the Bounty. Uh -huh. The little inner sea there... Actually, it was called the Bounty. Yes, <laughs> that is true. It was later renamed, and I'll come to that. It was later renamed as the Bitter Sea because of all the tears that uh. humanity shed at its source and over the course of the next centuries and the infighting between mm. them. Because you can imagine how desperate these people were. Yeah. They would get the, the feeling of the land has not died yet the further west we go. Mm -hmm. So they would cross the mountains and they would go all the way to the bounty. They reached the bounty. They found Ninua's gift. They settled there. Mm -hmm. They were a lot. And yeah. the shores are, well, not that big. <laughs> not no. that many. Not to mention that all the western side. So from here. Yes. Yeah, beyond the, it, it, was it was occupied. Yeah. Oh, it that's was already occupied. occupied. That is it, already is occupied. That, have we met them or is that uh, something? Well, we've mentioned them, I we've think. Mentioned the Weavers. Them. It's one of the other uh, exiles, one okay. of the other factions, the cousins of the Spires. Okay. They settled on that side of the world and claimed it for theirs. Mm -hmm. Nobody comes in, nobody comes out. Yeah. So not a lot of humans. No. Return yeah. to tell the tale of what they saw there. And where are the, the spires actually located on the world map here? Where have they Everywhere, actually. Yeah. The spires oh, are everywhere. scattered yeah. throughout okay. the entire world. Um, our website, which will be up soon, uh -huh. uh, actually has an interactive map which lets you see their locations um, on, on the map itself. Okay, I'm, I'm going to have to get a look at that because I'm, I'm intrigued to see if you were landing a force on this planet. How would you actually deploy your forces? How would you actually spread them out? That's intriguing. Well, the criteria were not military at the time. Mm. The criteria were purely biomantic. They were doing research and they were, well, I don't know the criteria. They are biomancers. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, nobody knows why they chose the specific locations that mm. they did. It was obviously important to, for biomantic reasons. It probably helped the spires themselves develop because they are sort of semi-living organisms. Yeah. The, those structures are yes. semi-living. So you have spires even under sea, because for X, Y, Z reason, okay. that was working for them. And other than that, they are spread all around. The, even in the Old Dominion, some of them still stand, as oh, far okay. as we know. And of course, there are quite a few inside the domain of the Hundred Kingdoms. Mm. Okay, so where is the main capital for the Hunger Hundred Kingdoms? That would be naturally on the bounty. On it's the bounty. on the Bitter Sea. It's uh, yeah. our game. It's on the Bitter Sea. We say capital. It used to be for a very short time being mm -hmm. capital because mm -hmm. humanity was never really united. Mm -hmm. But for a short, uh, I think it was three centuries, mm -hmm. more or less, mm -hmm. three centuries, uh, they were united under one banner. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it's as I said, medieval Europe. Mm -hmm. Anyone with enough swords to command to claim this is mine mm. was self-declared the king and everything was fine okay all this until well the orders came back from the closer mountain now i'm going to show you the seal temple again mm -hmm. the reason humanity survived managed to survive was all because of the last remaining legion of the old dominion now for political and religious reasons, uh, uh, reasons, they were exiled on that part of the Dominion mm -hmm. to the very far west. And they were the only standing one because they were the only ones that weren't actually in the Old Dominion and uh, to be dispersed or at least destroyed. Funny that they mm -hmm. should also be the order who held Cleon, the other god that resisted uh, Haslia. Yeah. You know, funny that they should find themselves in the only location where it was bound that they'd survive once the fall happened, mm. almost as if it was planned. Mm. Or uh, at least thought of. Thought of. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, with the Cleon's Legion, let's call it that, I think, for right. now, yeah. We, yeah. we can call it Cleon's Legion. With Cleon's Legion intact mm. and ready to defend humanity and the refugees, which, again, I'd like it is sort of what we like to do. It's the 
actual history projecting into a fantasy world. Mm -hmm. It's what a lot of the the so-called Templars were doing. Mm -hmm. They pro they protected refugees and pilgrims. Mm -hmm. It is an analog again in a very different way, but it is. So after protecting humanity, mm -hmm. they held that wall mm -hmm. where a second sacrifice took place, that of Cleon. Now, there is a lot of talk about what that could be, and the orders are very, very secretive about it. But whatever it was, turned one legion into a number of orders, different orders. Mm. There was some ideological differences that were created, not rivalry, no. Mm -hmm. They do share a common goal, which is to protect and safeguard humanity. Mm -hmm. But they each goes in their different way. Mm. So they, they each have a different aspect or some such that would follow? Uh, it was more of a, as I said, it's ideological and philosophical. Okay. It's, some believe that their role should be to protect them from any outside threat, mm. be that the Spires or maybe the Nords or whatever. Mm. Others believe that it's the infighting that should be. Mm. So they play different roles. And they held the reins for of humanity's destiny for a long time because the moment they came back and they reached the refugees and the myriads of kings that had, you know, put up a banner and said, "This is mine and I'm mm. king," that quickly went away when the orders came. You for a long time you have to had you you should have the tolerance of the orders mm. and the acceptance of the orders in order to be named king. Mm -hmm. Now, as the as the long the cold, the long winter slowly died out, mm -hmm. and the lands further east mm -hmm. from the bounty were once again ac uh, accessible, humanity spread out. And the good thing about humanity is that it populates easy. So, yeah. <laughs> so in those centuries, it's about uh, I think it's a full century and a half until the the long winter fully mm. goes away. They have repopulated and they have started to spread now don't forget that we say the orders and it sounds very majestic but at the time it was a legion mm -hmm. essentially that broke up mm -hmm. and a legion that had suffered losses that mm -hmm. broke up so it's it was very few of them mm -hmm. they couldn't keep up slowly and steadily the the balance of power in hum in, in humanity's um, society changed as well mm -hmm. and this is where faith started playing a part because obviously uh, an event like the fall cannot leave the religious questions mm -hmm. unanswered so uh what we call the theists mm -hmm. uh, were the first organized religion they are very they are very ritualistic uh and they closely affiliated themselves with the nobility as the chosen that led us out of the fall and uh. safeguard us so now nobility has a new patron it's not the orders it's divine mandate mm -hmm. again that can easily change political power comes into play but and for while power struggles between the faith the nobles and the orders escalates a new power emerges one very charismatic leader who would name himself later charles armatellum he would start forging an empire mm -hmm. whether by sword or by well, he used marriage a lot. I think <laughs> <laughs> he used marriage yeah. a lot. We ha we have a saying here uh, in the UK: by hook or by crook. <laughs> <laughs> True. True. Sort of. Yeah. yeah. Sort accurate. Of. Accurate. Sort of. And it's actually how he got his name. Mm -hmm. Armatellum is weapon, weapon mm -hmm. in sort. So he was believed to have two weapons: the actual sword and his mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So he forged what was later called the Telian Emperor. Interestingly enough, he was never emperor himself. No. Really? He named his son emperor, and he continued serving humanity's best interests by uh, joining the orders. Yeah. That's, again, you've taken something that you would normally look at within this world and go, oh, this guy's conquering everything. He's going to be emperor. No, 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 no. <laughs> this, uh, the prodigal son shall be your emperor. I'm off. <laughs> Very different. Well, to join the greatest political faction left yes. standing and make sure that they in, that they endorse my son. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, it's, it's, As there, there's being on the throne, but there's also being the power behind the throne. Well, well, that, yes, that was Charles, especially in the beginning. That was Charles. Mm. But again, so an empire is forging. Mm. And it 
covers most, not all, of what is today's Hundred Kingdoms. Uh, it seems like humanity is reaching a second dominion era, but of course that's not the case. Mm. Now there are too many people that have a, a crown on their head. Mm. And even if they bent the knee before an emperor, they are still kings. And that does not go away. Mm. So the local political interest, intricacies exist. There's some conflict with the tolerance of the emperor. Mm -hmm. So again, the nobility find themselves answering to someone. Mm -hmm. Now it's the emperor. Now it's good business because trade is flourishing. Mm -hmm. uh, coins are very moderated so everything and regulated so everything is safe. Trade is safe suddenly. And it seems like a good deal for everyone. Well, almost, I guess. <laughs> but that too is destined to slowly die out. Mm -hmm. The emperor's line dies out mm -hmm. some centuries later. It dies out and nobody has the power to claim it without mm -hmm. the others. Yes. Which is one of the of the ways that the emperor held his office. Yes. <laughs> he, he would not allow anyone to be as powerful as him. Mm -hmm. So there is a critical moment in recent sort of human history that finds everyone gathered in the capital, the throne being hollow, and that is uh, how they refer to it since then, and a conclave of nobles, the greatest nobles and spiritual leaders, because there's a second uh, religion that has appeared in the meantime, endorsed by the orders, actually mm -hmm. believed to counter the influence of the other one. Mm. And a new status quo is created. There is no emperor on the throne. Mm -hmm. There is a conclave that meets now and then. Yes. And the nobles, for the first time, are the masters on themselves. Yes. This allows them to have their own forces unregulated. Uh oh. Yes. <laughs> so you can imagine why it's named a hundred kingdoms. It's not. It's. I don't think ever in history there were exactly maybe one hundred, but it's a number that keeps changing. Yes. And to that volatile mix, you have the the, the faith that slowly sees without the regulation of the emperor, they too see that. Wait a minute. I have so many people that are ready to follow me. A lot of nobles are really, you know, rely heavily on me to keep their claim now. And the orders have kind of not died out, not by a long shot, mm. but their influence mm. was spread too thin because mm. they relied a lot on the emperor. Mm -hmm. It was a very close relationship they had for some time. Everybody wants a part of the cake. Yeah. And this is where hum we find humanity today, where the merchants, princes that Stavros mentioned before, mm -hmm. shows up. Now, to give you a, an image of how faith militarized can look. Oh my god, wow! Now, that is... Now that is uh, a spiritual leader in our world. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, what a spiritual leader is in our world looks like. While the imperial remnants remain and they hold their ground, some of them said, no, we're not going anywhere. We are the best trained soldiers in the, mm -hmm. in the land. We're not going anywhere. Make us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when you look like this, I don't think anybody is going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. This is a, an imperial officer, uh, an officer of the imperial remnants that still remain and regulate sort of the mm -hmm. nobles, only sort of. And to this mix, we can add people like the, oh, that is uh, a concept for one of the orders, because there's going to be a lot. Of, well, not a lot, but it's not going to be... There are five mm. main orders. Main orders. I, if I'm going to put my vote in for one of these, number three. <laughs> that is beautifully designed armor. I love the, the way the, the face mask work. It's less human. Whereas the others still have a bit of humanity to them, but that, that, that faceless power... Well, really if, cool. if you look for less human, how about this order? <laughs> now, oh this my is, god, does this... The fourth one has, like, sensors in his shoulder? That yeah. is the order of St. Lazarus. Uh-huh. Now, the, the story behind the order of St. Lazarus and St. Lazarus himself was that in the battle uh, at the Closterine Wall, mm. right after the fall, where the... Uh, sacrifice of Cleon took place to stop whatever calamity was following from the fall, from the yeah. lands of the fall. One of the lepers that was there in a, in a society that were living and they were the crippled, the, the wounded and the maimed, there was 
a leper among them, mm. Saint Lazarus, who inspired and given uh, a blessing, we can say, mm -hmm. I think, by Cleon himself mm -hmm. took up arms to defend humanity. Ah. And a lot of the those outcasts suddenly armed themselves and helped the orders defend the refugees. Mm -hmm. Now that was Saint Lazarus, and that is what the order is today. It involves all those maimed and lepers and outcasts of society. Now they, unlike the other orders, they are fewer, much fewer in number, and their numbers are diminishing. Yeah. But in order to hide the the smell that they may have, they actually use sensed mm. maces and armors and that is th clever i think i think we can say this mm, all right i think uh, stavros's idea was i want leprous batman <laughs> <laughs> a leper batman yes they are the vigilantes of those that have been outcasted that are left behind now that you say it, I'm, I'm, let's look at the artwork, I'm getting that vibe, <laughs> getting that Dark Avenger vibe off these guys. Uh, yeah, I think there was, there was literally a moment where I was like, give me Leper Batman, <laughs> yeah. and I'm looked at by my artist, and he's like, okay, I'll see what I can do with that. And I'm like, yeah, I think I can write Leper <laughs> I will try, I will try. I mean, like, it's, it's a very different take, I mean, like, whenever an artist is given a brief that's a little bit broad like that, yeah. should I say. <laughs> You know, you could go anywhere with it, but the, the concept that your artist has came up with, the fact that these are heavily armored guys, full face masks, so you, you can't see them, having the, the maces with sensors built in, having like shoulder pads with sensors built in, having like a, a necklace there on the, the first one with a, mm -hmm, a sensor yeah. built in there, it all makes sense. It's all logical the way that it has been built and put together, which I, I absolutely adore. While it is fantasy, because this could never work. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, you know what I mean. But there's a, a logical progression within a fantasy world where you yeah. can suspend some of the, the regular laws and think, exactly. well, how would I actually work this out in, a, in this world? You know, okay, uh, so I'm, I'm a leper, I need to hide the, the smell of it. Let's stick some sensors on me. Where do you want to put them? And, you know, from there, your artist can actually, you know, expand upon it and, you know, make it a little silly, but he's kept it to a, a realm where it's not ridiculously silly. Mm -hmm. That is something we strive mm -hmm. with the world and the, and the units in general. We want gritty mm -hmm. realism in fantasy. Mm -hmm. That's what we want. Mat it, it, we're aiming for a world that is mature. Mm -hmm. we, I think we kind of grew up ourselves. <laughs> I think that's what happened. No, keep the other job alive! No, we do. We're, we're, we're making games. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, and well, I think this is a very nice picture of the. It's what we call the iconic Hundred Kingdoms. Mm. It shows one of the nobles and what is going on behind. Now, obviously, this is a tapestry. He's not so cool, and behind him, there's this battle. Can I? But, can I interrupt? Of course. Uh -huh. So remember, I told you this artist um, upsets me. Yes, another <laughs> okay. one. No, 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 no it's, it's the same, the same artist. artist. It's the no, same no, one. No, no, I mean, another image that he's done it with. Oh yes, yes, this one. Yeah. Um, that tapestry that you see in the background is based on one of the most famous uh, early Italian tapestries. Uh -huh. It actually stretches that way and this way, oh, so a full two meters and two meters behind him. <laughs> the tapestry took him longer to make. <laughs> than the knight himself. Take it easy. <laughs> so, so hang on, but behind the black here that's on the screen, there is a, a full width tapestry? Yes. Yes. yes he, 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 Your he, artist he... is a madman. I love him. Yes, I know. I oh, yeah. I love him too, and unfortunately I have to try to rein him in. <laughs> um, but it's, I mean... Gorgeous. Yeah. Simply yeah. gorgeous. Now, sorry. these are the two factions that we're starting mm. the game with. They are... They set the tone for what we want in general. We want complex factions with their own motivations. Mm -hmm. We want realistic war between them. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why war happens. Mm -hmm. We don't want war for war's sake. Yes. We want things to evolve into that state. Mm -hmm. And I truly hope we've succeeded in making mm -hmm. this. Well, from, from everything you've told me, you have created two fully-fledged, complex societies with their own geopolitical states that they're going to be fighting. There are chances for them to fight themselves because of you know the infighting that you would have on the Spire side, on the Hundred Kingdom side. You have reasons why they might work and trade together sometimes. So if you want to do like narrative campaigns and things, 
there is tons mm -hmm. of scope with both these factions. Uh, if anybody's curious, I actually did get a demo game of this on. You can go and watch it. I believe we have the video white for it. I hope I'm saying that right, and we haven't got it sitting in the can waiting to go. <laughs> uh, tell you what, get your comments in below. Which of the two factions here are intriguing you the most? Will it be the Spire or the Hundred Kingdoms? Uh, keep an eye out. I'm sure the Parabellum guys will be keeping an eye on the comments for anything really cool to actually feed back to you. We'll move on. We will see you in the next one. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now, and be sure to check out beastsofwar.com for the latest gaming news and gaming let's plays. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.